white man rob poor Injun. So you think you're being robbed, eh? Be glad it's not 300 years later. You might have been wiped out in the stock market. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast. This is episode number 16, or 19 if you're actually counting them. After the end of the Marx Brothers, I am Bob Gassell, and as always, well, except for the last episode, I'm joined by my much more knowledgeable and accomplished co-hosts. First, from across the pond in Bath, England, we have the author of what to me is the greatest Marx book that Leonard Moulton has never acknowledged, The Annotated Marx Brothers. <laughs> He's also penned That's Me Groucho, Egyptomania Goes to the Movies, Jane Austen, Inside Her Navel, a novel, um, and the brand new Movies Are a Conspiracy, Selected Essays on Cinema. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matthew Conium. Hello, everybody. I am Matthew Conium, and if you go to the back of the boat, it looks just like me. <laughs> Let us also welcome the savior of Alsatias. He is the author of Give Me a Thrill, a performer, songwriter, producer, designer, and from what I've been reading, has recently taken to walking the streets of New York City. Here he is, Mr. Noah Diamond. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Anything to earn Leonard Malton's respect. <laughs> so fill us in on these New York walking tours you got going. Well, you know... My first gig in New York City was as a licensed tour guide, and that was my day job for a long time, uh, mostly on double-decker buses, just telling the story of the city. And I always felt when I was doing that job that what I was really doing was developing material for a one-man show. Mm -hmm. And so the multimedia monologue that I'm calling 400 Years in Manhattan is coming to the United Solo Festival on 42nd Street this fall. And in order to get myself in shape for it, I've been doing walking tours all through the summer, including one that has a lot of Marx Brothers related locations and stories in it. Mm -hmm. And I trust all of our listeners probably every few minutes are refreshing <laughs> noahdiamond.com to see what I might be working on. Um, so take a look. And if you're near New York, come take a walk with me this summer. Very cool. And if you're still doing okay. them next March, it's it's likely we're going to be there. Oh yeah, we're pretty. We're, if we're, you are here, we will we will make sure we properly yes. celebrate that. Plans are in the works for the three of us to be on the same continent. Matthew takes Manhattan, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is my harebrained uh, idea for an episode. So. Uh, if you don't like it, send the letters to me. Let me get my notes out. Um, as we all know, the Marxist career as a team basically ended with 1949's Love Happy, but that didn't stop the plans and rumors for more projects to continue throughout the 50s, most of them quite pedestrian, but some extremely mouth-watering in possibility. After at least two announced retirements, no one really believed them when they said they were done. And the only thing that finally put a stop to these rumors was Chico's 1961 death. So we're going to examine the last decade of the Marxist career in which the three of them performed together on screen for about 10 seconds. We'll look at all these rumored, planned, and even started projects uh, that, to be honest, are perhaps better left to our imagination. So with that, I'm throwing away the script. And I, you know, I guess we're going to start at the end. That uh, Love Happy is finished and the Marxists say they're done again, but there is still this lingering biopic in, in the air that we've talked about many times over the last few episodes. Is there anything we need to add to that? I think only that it was that that was the main deal, really. I think that was always the thing that the other ideas were revolving around, including Love Happy. I think the reason really why Love Happy got off the ground was because there was the chance that it that it was going to lead to that. Um, obviously, Lester Cowan is the source of most of the rumors of um, new productions around that time. Uh, a lot of them, obviously, are are just made up um, ideas to just to keep their names in in print. Um, there was, I think, the most um, detailed one was that 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 Cowan wanted to make a a sort of an episodic film uh, in which all three brothers would appear, but separately. Um, there was a lot of talk mm -hmm. of him uh, using Groucho um, in England as a Scotland Yard detective. There are various versions of that project. And there's also Harpo himself talking about a project he wants to do in France called called The Clown, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I suspect that those were both intended as episodes of a, of a three-part film in which Harpo was going to be in a French-type movie in Paris. Presumably that means a, a COD silent movie. 
Um, mm. Groucho was, was to be a Scotland Yard detective and Chico was going to play an Italian guide for tourists in Rome. Uh, so he would have, that would have settled once and for all the is Chico Italian, uh, question. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was, uh, that was the most advanced Cowan project other than the one that did get made, which was Low Happy and the one that didn't get made but almost did and and makes our mouths water the most which was the biopic which was a definite plan all five brothers were uh, were into it but as we yeah. know it's uh, it never quite arrived and the, they were talking about it in seemed all the way through at least 1958 there there's there serious talk about it and don't know exactly why it didn't happen be because there were so many biopics done of that era time frame yeah, Sheila Graham in 1956 uh, said that it was it was again a going concern. Uh, Harold Hefferman, uh, the following March, March of 1957, said that uh, all five of them, or, or four of them, including Gummo and possibly Zeppo, would would be involved. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one, that one. <laughs> they got, got Gummo, but well. Zeppo was holding out. <laughs> if they could write a part for him, yeah. If they could find a believable role for him to play. That one got as far as scripting, which which Joe Adamson um, has read and said uh, that he didn't think it was any good. Uh, so so there's no question that those biopic plans were were genuine and that they, it almost came to fruition at least twice. Sadly, not to be. The only other thing of note that I've come across, and I mentioned this a few episodes ago, that in 1958, uh, in this article about this uh, up and coming comedy team. Uh, Marty Allen and Mitch DeWood that uh, mentions that they are uh, have auditioned or are planning to audition for the roles in the biopic uh, Harpo uh, M- Marty as Harpo and Mitch as Gummo. That's Gummo, so, yeah. What would he base that on? <laughs> imagine being a comedian and said, "Hey, we want you to play one of the Marx Brothers in a movie." Oh, which one, uh, Gummo? <laughs> yeah, the one that nobody living has ever seen before. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be perfect. Yes. You have to stand in front of the mirror for hours and practice selling ladies' clothing. <laughs> let's let's talk about this in the hypothetical. What like filmmaker around it during that era would you have trusted to like to make this film? What director, what writer would you like to see attached to it? Well, certainly not Lester Cowan as mm. as, as producer. Um yeah, I mean it's hard to say because obviously the, it, it was a time of biopics, wasn't it? It was a big before yeah. that. It was the the key time before the nineteen seventies when when Hollywood sort of looked over its shoulder and uh, exhumed uh, its old stars. But but I think if if there's anything that the majority of those films have in common, um, it's that they didn't try very hard. Whether 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 you like them or not. Uh, you know, the Buster Keaton story or Man of a Thousand Faces or um, I'll Cry Tomorrow. N- not a, a huge amount of effort was put into actually recreating what those people were like. Um, it was almost as mm-hmm. if it was it was thought that it didn't really matter anymore. And the Marx Brothers were very different in that they, they had a very, you know, a very, very precise and specific screen uh, persona, persona. So I can't see it coming off easily i think it would have required a degree of commitment and and passion and and depth of knowledge that probably wasn't in in you know conspicuously great quantities at that time you know alfred e green who directed the jolson story in 1946 and i suppose on the strength of that success also directed the Jackie Robinson story in 1950 and the Eddie Cantor story in 1953 was also the director of Copacabana in 1947. And I wonder if him crossing paths with Groucho on Copacabana, um, if he was sort of being set up to maybe helm this biopic if it happened. Uh, Groucho described Green um, while to uh, to Miriam, I think, while uh, while they were making Copacabana, as an ancient incompetent who lives in the past and discusses <laughs> discusses nothing that has occurred since the First World War. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't make a director out of green. Yeah. <laughs> and, we, and we might mention that this ancient incompetent was one year older than Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> so with the biopic sitting in limbo, uh, the Marxists obviously had to move on with their careers. And though they didn't do a team project, uh, Chico and Harpo did do a lot of work together, at least in the first half of the decade. They appeared on uh, Colgate Comedy Hour 
apparently they were trying to get Groucho to, to come on that too, but he wasn't interested and was more than the other two who really distanced themselves from, from the team. But Chico and Harpo did do a lot of work together on TV and on stage in Vegas, state fairs, things like that. They, it's a shame they never did any uh, a film together. Yes, there was some talk in 1951 of them possibly all appearing again on Broadway. Um, a Broadway producer called Lee Sabinson uh, offered to uh, team the three of them again in a musical stage version of Moliere's The Doctor in Spite of Himself. But uh, apparently um, the boys vow they'll never work together again was the was the reason why that uh was next um and then there's lots of talk about television dorothy kilgallen in 1954 mm. says harper and chico are pressuring groucho to yield to offers yeah. for a television comedy series right. which obviously never i see a 1954 thing here where gummo is negotiating uh, asking for a uh, hundred thousand dollars for them to get together yes and then there are the, the these repeated claims of a of an animal crackers remake which which oh, yes, uh, yes. pops up in uh, uh, both in in film and in television in 1956. There's a very detailed uh, account that uh, Chico uh, saying that they're going to do a color spectacular based on uh, on Animal Crackers. He says the music was good, the jokes up to date. Only the costumes would have to be changed. We even remember the episodes. <laughs> so uh, a very encouraging. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think this is just something he was daydreaming about. I think so too. Yeah. 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 Was, that was his best part, wasn't it? And Still, though, this would have been so great to see, and I'll tell you why. Um, you know, with all the great footage we have the Marxes, from films, mm. from TV appearances, newsreels, whatever, the one thing we don't have, the one thing we don't have is anything of them in front of a, as a team in front of a live audience. And from all accounts, that's when they were at their best. That's a very good point. Yes, we've got yeah. pairs of them, haven't we? But not not the full the full complement, yeah. The nearest we ever get to what that Animal Crackers revival might have been like, I suppose, is the Hollywood Palace with yeah. Groucho and Margaret mm. Dumont. Um, Harpo and Chico aren't there, of course, but uh, Groucho and Dumont recreate the opening of Animal Crackers in a slightly different form. And it's an amusing, nostalgic bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. does give a nice taste of how Groucho would perform in front of an audience, that, that material. Yeah, and he breaks Dumont up a yeah. little bit, which is a lovely moment. Yeah. She laughs, which uh, dispels many myths about her. She says, I'm highly honored. And he <laughs> says, I thought you were highly Selassie. And it gets a, you know, she she cracks up. Yeah, so even though there was likely nothing to this rumor, it still would have been great to see. Though perhaps this is better left to our imagination as a fantasy. Next, we have a relatively unknown project, which is, as far as I know, the first time the brothers appeared on the same TV show. From 1956, Inside Beverly Hills. Now, this was a mostly live all-star special commemorating the 50th anniversary of Beverly Hills' founding. Harper appeared with his family in a film piece, while Groucho and Chico appeared sporadically throughout the special in separate pieces, though they did encounter each other for a few moments. Hey, you look like the fellow used to be my brother. I don't think I got your name. No, I got my name. I think you're pulling my leg. Yeah, just to get him even. Well, would you mind helping me push this camera store around? <laughs> I'm a sorry. I got to go to the golf course and lay down in the sand trap. Sand trap? Yeah, you see, it's a Sunday, and that's when I see my psychiatrist. <laughs> I'm sure I used to know him. If I'm not mistaken, we both had the same mother. Well, I think the premise of this whole thing is that Chico's trying to move into Beverly Hills, but they don't want him there. I don't know if they have a thing against Italians or Jews or whatever, but they don't want him. They don't, they don't want <laughs> yes. him in Beverly Hills. Just that Italian was the Jews, infamous no Jews impersonating <laughs> Italians need apply period in Beverly Hills. So that was nice to see, though. You know, uh, Groucho and Chico do pop up here and there throughout the special, and Harpo appears in a film piece. Uh, but the most interesting thing about this special is that in the newspaper articles and columns leading up to it in the weeks and months before, it is said that Gummo was going to appear in this. And at first I thought it was a typo, but it appeared in too many different columns and in too many different contexts for it to be that way. It just, But for whatever reason, it, it didn't happen. Yeah, that's news to me. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Let me see. Wait, I got one here. Val Adams, syndicated reporter. Uh, NBC will televise the Beverly Hills story. That was an early title for it. Next month is one of its special 90-minute features. It will include appearances by a large number 
of motion pictures, personalities, and film visits to some of their homes. The show will air Sunday, January 29th. Among the guests will be three of the Marx Brothers, Groucho, Gummo, and Chico. And like I said, there were other articles that said similar things, but in different ways. So like I, said, it, I don't think it was a typo, but it's a shame. Uh, Jay, Jay, you didn't ask uh, John Goodell about this. Come on, what's the deal here? Come on, Jay. <laughs> Go back to that house. Knock yeah. on the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe Gummo saw this period as his opportunity to finally become mm. the star of the act. <laughs> <laughs> and throughout this whole time, of course, Groucho's uh, doing You Bet Your Life. And uh, Harpo does make an appearance uh, in the very last season of Hawking his book. Uh, I believe Chico is seen once in the audience. I think he's there more than once. Yeah, I think he because he was on the payroll, wasn't he? Groucho was um, was siphoning off a little bit of the uh, of the profits into his uh, into his Chico's retirement yeah. fund. So I think he was there more than once. But yes, there is that photo of them on on stage together. I'm not sure what what they're doing. I don't know if they're shooting the the creamy prom advert or something. I'm, I I don't know. So let's move on to the last official Marx Brothers film. The Story of Mankind, and, you know, Groucho Harpo and Chico obviously appear in this separately, and producer Erwin Allen has gotten a lot of flack for not putting them together, but uh, I think that he's gotten a bad rap for this, and, mm. you know, Matthew has some definite thoughts about this. Yes, I mean, I don't think it's a great conspiracy or, or anything of of that nature, but it was a very haphazardly put together uh, production. Uh, um, Groucho was obviously signed because he was he was a friend of Owen Allen's already. Owen Allen had worked on a couple of his solo films, and they were good friends. So in his in his you bet your life uh, persona, he was he was brought in to play uh, Peter Minuet, and that sequence was written obviously for him. And then I think I think later um, it kind of occurred to Owen Allen that it would be a good idea to, to get the, the other Marx brothers in as well and make a, make an event of it to that extent. Um, but even, even it with the best will in the world, even if, if all everyone involved was, was, was of a single mind, that doesn't mean that it was then going to be possible within that very specific framework to, to, to get the three, um, into the same sequence. Obviously, they couldn't all be usefully in the Peter Minuet sequence, so it, it would mean junking that, and that's probably, I think, even if you're not a Marx Brothers fan, one of the best bits in the movie. Um, so, so you know, the the scope really wasn't there within the story of, of human history for, for a scene involving three people, one of whom doesn't talk, one of whom is probably going to be an Italian, you know. The, the, just the room wasn't there. But also, you know, as we know, Groucho was very resistant to the idea of of reunion appearances he did take an awful lot of of persuasion to do anything of that sort so i think it would just be the obvious and natural idea to put them in in something separate and as we know unfortunately um quite a nice idea was was come up with for for harpo and absolutely nothing was thought of for chico yet again and he's mm -hmm. he's just shunted into a demeaning um, appearance in which uh, even steadfast Marx Brothers fans can literally not notice. It just absolutely passes by. He's a he's an anonymous monk. He hasn't even got a name. Um, telling telling Columbus that he'll fall off the end of the oeth. Just suppose it were possible to reach the Indies by traveling in the opposite direction, west instead of east, and just suppose the route were shorter and more direct. Impossible, impossible. Yes, but why? I'll show you why. Only madmen would sail under your command. You would sail right off the end of the earth into a dark abyss. Boom! No more ship. Boom! Although the idea of Chico being a monk is probably f funny in itself. <laughs> yes, but, you know, I mean, I anyone surely what a missed opportunity written, what a missed opportunity written yeah, up yeah. something for him to do you know i mean why couldn't he play the piano or something anything you know harpo gets to play the harp isaac newton so far as i know he invented the cat flap but he didn't play the harp so if yeah. you're gonna you know if you're gonna have some artistic license it's just tragic why not cast chico as the chief in the peter minuet that's what I was segment. Thinking, yeah. I mean, it would, you know, it would actually ease the, you know, ethnic problem that that scene has um, to just make it Chico Marx. Or as Columbus. Yeah. Or as Columbus. You know, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I can't remember who plays Columbus, but it's nobody particularly famous, is it? It's not one of the, not one of the, uh, the closest that film comes to big, big star names, I don't think. He would have been a very amusing, you know, do a funny Columbus. 
I think there's some evidence that Groucho had to be courted to appear in this movie in the fact that Eden and Melinda and Harry Ruby all turn up in mm. bit parts. Mm. Um, and you could just picture Irwin Allen, like just peppering Groucho's friends with cameos in an effort to yes. soften uh, the ground for Groucho. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll raise my offer to $22. $26, not cent less for Island of Manhattan. Why don't we have a drink and forget the whole deal? Uh, my medicine man told me no drink, no smoke. No drink and no smoke? No. What about girls? No girls. Now, just let me get this straight. You're not allowed to drink? No. No smoke? And no girls? No. No girls. Well, what do you want the $26 for? Now, let me just say the fact that this bit, which is considered one of the best in the film, sounds like a Go West deleted scene, uh, <laughs> indicates the quality of the rest of the film. Uh, yeah, he even says the words Go West in yeah. that scene. At least it is, you know, it's written for Groucho, and he's got quips, oh, yeah. and he, you know, he does the eyebrows, and, you know, it's 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 a nice enough little little scene. And Harpo is given a, you know, a, a relatively amusing silent scene that makes use of him and what he does. Yes, and it's nice to see uh, Harpo in color. It's lovely to see that. That flaming red wig, red yes, wig. beautiful yeah. wig, yeah. And also the beautiful, gleaming golden harp. He always mm. played a black and white harp in the earlier films. Yes. It's a little interesting that Groucho, the Groucho character at this point, is so clearly the You Bet Your Life Groucho. Yes. And in, actually, in Story of Mankind and The Incredible Jewel Robbery and Deputy Seraph, there are references to You Bet Your Life. If me no need money, you no buy for $50. Not even a hundred dollars. One answer between the two of you, please. And it's amazing the degree to which the Quizmaster Groucho has completely eclipsed yes. the earlier persona. I mean, even in uh, Girl in Every Port, actually, he's he's the You Bet Your Life Groucho, isn't he? With his with his hair scraped yes. back and uh, those 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 glasses with the the clear plastic frames. Um, it's, right. Yes, it is interesting that uh, I don't know if anybody suggested to him in uh, Story of Mankind that he could, he, you know, he could do a, a grease paint Groucho, but uh, I doubt he would have taken too uh, too warmly to the suggestion. Yeah, it's interesting to say he never would have done that, but he he did do it right around that time on that variety show where he sang Doctor Hackenbush, right? That's right. And um, about 10 years later on the Gleason show, he also reverts to grease paint. He certainly does on the Gleason. Yeah. Does he do it on, on his um, yeah, yeah. Hackenbush? Does he? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 There's a couple of those. In, in one, he does. He has grease paint. And in one, he has the organic mustache. I suppose because there he's, he's recreating actual, actual Mark's Marx Brothers stuff, isn't he? I suppose. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the same principle as the Go West number in Copacabana, yes. like a cameo from the earlier persona. Okay, so let's get into perhaps the most noteworthy and frustrating Marx reunion of the era. Their February 1957 appearance on Tonight, uh, which by all intents and purposes is lost to history. Uh, first, a little background. At the end of 1956, Steve Allen and Ernie Kovacs, who had been alternating hosts, decided to leave The Tonight Show. And NBC rather than hire a new host, decided to reinvent the thing. They turned it into a magazine-style format and renamed it Tonight, America After Dark. It was basically like a nighttime version of the Today Show. And the host was uh, Jack Lascouli, who was actually a regular on the Today Show. This format lasted about six months before they abandoned it and hired Jack Parr to host, and they went back to the old studio talk show format. Anyhow, it was during this brief magazine experiment that the Marxists appeared. Chico had been touring the country in a stage drama called The Fifth Season, and when it came to Los Angeles, it was arranged that the five brothers would be interviewed backstage on opening night. Now, two things to note. First, they were interviewed remotely by La Schooley, who was in New York City. And secondly, and most importantly, since tonight was airing on the East Coast at the same time the play was going on in Los Angeles, the interview was not done live but was pre-filmed and rolled into the show. Uh, Robert Bader, who has seen uh, show logs, has confirmed this to me. Now, right around here is where I'd play a clip of the show, but since we don't have any, you'll just have to imagine what it sounded like. Um, now, the fact that this interview is pre-filmed makes it even doubly frustrating that, uh, it, that it's missing because the kinescope of the episode is gone and this pre-filmed piece done on the other side of the country is gone as well. It sucks. You know, it's understandable why humor risk is missing. Uh, no one knew its value at the time. How could they have? But this is different. 
the disappearance of the brothers together was heavily promoted by the network as a noteworthy, if not historical event before it even aired. So it boggles the mind that it wasn't kept by someone. So while we don't have the actual interview, I did find a couple of newspaper clippings that give us some idea of what went on. No, why don't you read that one from the Boston Globe? Uh, sure, Bob. This is the Boston Globe, February 24th, 1957. The headline is Marx Brothers, all five of them, tell how they got those odd first names. The nation caught a glimpse of one of the top comedy combinations of a past era when the five Marx Brothers, Groucho, Chico, Harpo, Gummo, and Zeppo, made their first public appearance in nearly 20 years on Tonight recently. Gummo said, I got my name because I wore gum-soled shoes. Groucho refused to accept the definition that Chico got his name because of his Italian bits. Instead, Groucho stated that Chico got his name because he used to chase girls. And in those days, girls were called chickens. And there were chicken chasers. And we shortened it to Chico. Zeppo said he was born Zeke. Hold for incredulous response. (laughs) But later changed to the stage name. Harpo nodded to the fact that his name came with his playing the harp, and Groucho said, I got my name because I'm always smiling. Filming is set to begin on the life story of the Five Marxes in October. Gummo suggested, how about Pinky Lee playing Harpo? I think Jerry Lewis should play Groucho, said Zeppo, and I think Harpo should play Pinky Lee, chimed in Groucho. Chico answered the big question of, do you think the five of you will ever make another appearance together in a movie or a television program? Yes, I think we will. And in a bigger way than we did before. (laughs) And the only other thing I could find was not very enthusiastic. This is from the Vancouver Sun. The five Marx brothers were anything but an artistic success when they appeared on Tonight. They acted as if the TV camera was an intrusion on their privacy. I guess they didn't blow them away. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's very poignant to imagine Chico in 1957 saying, oh, yes, we're going to come back bigger than ever before. You know, and that was always his attitude. In 1916, you know, he was the one saying we're going to be huge when, mm. when none of the others really believed in it. But here he is, um, you know, 40 years later, still at least for his public face, um, being so optimistic, so upbeat. You can picture him on his deathbed predicting big things ahead. <laughs> it is interesting that uh, the first time Groucho finally gives in and agrees to appear with the others is when they're out of character. Maybe it's more than coincidental that it was late 1956, just a couple months before, when a new uh, round of stories about the biopic started hitting. So maybe they were trying to drum up interest that way. Yes, I mean it's interesting, isn't it? That these all these sort of announcements of the, of things they're going to be doing always come in in clumps. They always come around things that they did do. So, for instance, around the time of Love Happy, there were all sorts of stories, and then it goes quiet for a few years. And then when the story of mankind happens, they all kind of crank up again, and the biopic cranks up again. And um, there's this thing. Um, uh, comic strip wasn't there uh, George Panetta's off-Broadway success comic strip in 1958 mm. uh, it was announced that they were getting the, the film rights to that Panetta is not a name that I know but he, he did contribute to Love Happy and he wrote Papa Romani so there is a Marx connection there um, and then uh, again in 1958 Jerry Lewis uh, supposedly wanted them in a film called Crazy House set in a boarding house for, for old vaudevillians Um and and obviously, uh, you know, um, Jewel Robbery in a moment will will mention did happen. So so it does, you know, when these stories spurt up, I think even if the actual claims themselves are not are not uh, to be believed, the the fact that that collaborations are in the air, um, obviously, are to be believed. And so yes, I would imagine that the point of that interview was to kind of. I'd not test the water, but to sort of announce that that they were around again on mass, and I cannot believe it doesn't exist. I mean, even when I thought it was live, and it, and it would only the only hope would have been a kinescope or something, uh, it still seemed obvious to me that 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 would have been done and would have been done deliberately because it was such a momentous thing, and that Gummo or somebody would have had a copy. Now that I know that it was it was filmed. Um, I think, you know, it's just, it must be out there. I really, I'm sure somebody's got that. 
Yeah, it's just hard to believe that one of the family members didn't say, oh, we got to get a copy of this. Even, mm. even before it happened, they said, oh, mm. let's make sure we get a copy. And it might just be there hidden away somewhere. Yeah. You know? Gummo. I think Gummo had it. I wonder if it's noteworthy and maybe a little touching that the event that this appearance was built around was a theatrical role for Chico um, in this play, the fifth season, which which had nothing to do with his brothers. I mean, it was a Chico solo gig mm. and the others kind of coming together for the sake of helping to promote that project and thereby also promote Chico's um, you know, viability and legitimacy as a star at this point. I noticed in the stills that exist that the visiting brothers all keep their hats and raincoats on, like they don't plan on staying very long. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, pictures of all the Marx Brothers together in their civilian clothes, they always appear a little bit like gangsters Mm. um, in the early days and in the later days. Yeah, Yeah. let's talk about, we we do have a handful of pictures of them in the 50s together. And we got got that, we got the one here, we got the one that seems to, I guess, is backstage in Vegas, the color one. It looks right, like it's in a dressing room, right? And there's some from the 20s and 30s too, yeah. where they're just all in trench coats and fedoras, right? And the room service then, around the table ones as well, right? And then there's that last one on the couch. Uh, apparently, I guess it's from 1961. That's always claimed that it's what it is. Chico's looks like he's wearing a leisure suit. Yeah. So next thing we have here, this uh, corporate film from 1958 called. Showdown at Ulcer Gulch, which I guess was a in-house thing done for the Saturday Evening Post sales convention. Stagecoach is six days late. That's why I haven't been on the stage in years. It's just a 20-minute short, and Groucho has one line, and Chico plays piano for about a minute. And that's about the extent of the Marx's uh, involvement. It is in color. Yeah, it's sort of a demo reel for Seamus Culhane, who was Maxine Marx's husband and a Disney animator of some accomplishment. Mm. And this, I think, was his attempt to demonstrate his potential prowess as a live action director. So it's full of strange directorial tricks and devices, uh, at, like a demo reel would be. It is on. The, it is available, by the way, on the Marx Brothers TV Collection DVD set. Yes, well restored for what it's worth. It has the production values of a nice home movie. Let's let's put it that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. It makes the creamy prom commercials look like the Ten Commandments. <laughs> what what other celebrities appear in this? Do, do Hope and Crosby make a little momentary? Yeah, uh, Orson Bean. Orson Bean, who's still around? Maybe he could give us some background someday. Yes, call in Orson if you're listening. <laughs> So I've never seen this, actually. I I think it's probably the only thing on that set that I've never actually sat down and, and held my eyelids open with matchsticks and, and got all the way through. It's obviously, by the title, uh, like a Western parody. I mean, what, what, yeah. am I missing anything, really? Or No. 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 Oh, Ernie Kovacs. Uh, Ernie Kovacs and Edie Adams. Oh, now you tell brief me. Brief appearances, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But any film where Orson Bean uh, gets shot is worth seeing. So let's move on to 1959 and The Incredible Jewel Robbery. General Electric Television Special was an anthology series uh, hosted by Ronald Reagan. Yes. Harpo and Chico did an appearance here. And do we know anything about how this came to be, why they decided to to get involved or anything? Uh, Hang on. (laughs) I don't think Was so. that, no, is that off the type? No, you can, no cheating. <laughs> in the Ronald Reagan intro, which is on the Marx Brothers TV collection DVD set, um, you know, Reagan says Chico, not Chico. And I think if Carter had made an issue of that, things might have gone very differently in 1980. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know how it came about, actually. But um... now the director was a guy named Mitchell Leeson, who I don't really know, but. See that he did some Twilight Zone episodes. And he did some very, very important movies. He started off working for Cecil B. DeMille as, I mm-hmm. think, his costume designer, certainly in, in some, some capacity, and then branched out as a director in his own right. And he's one of those uh, directors with a, with, with a long list of, of very stylish films that, that you know, the, the name doesn't ring a bell for most people. But if you actually sit down and pick any sort of four or five of his films, um, he's actually one of my mm-hmm. favorite favorite movie directors um okay. so 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 yeah that's a that that's a good you know a good omen and, and this is actually something that i that i do unequivocally like i know a lot of people 
don't like the jewel robbery. Um, it's got things wrong with it. It needs mm. it needs tightening. The the first yeah. half should be sped up. It should be much much yeah. snappier. The laugh track shouldn't be on there. But I think if once you take off all the take off all the rubbish, take off all the Ronald Reagan, take off that pointless pre credits bit which is which is just a bit from later on god knows what the point of that yeah. is start it when the credits start um rescore it take the laughter off yeah. i think you've got a very decent little comedy here and and i and i enjoy it without reservation it's it i don't dislike it i'm just befuddled by what the point of all this was um harpo only has a handful of gags really and you got a 72 year old verbal comedian in chico not saying a word. Who thought this was a good idea? Who thought this was a good use of their talents? It's a Harpo film, certainly. Um, but I think it's it's very nice to see Chico there. As I, as I point out in in my book, that the whole thing needs tightening, and there are there are all sorts of potentially good things that don't really convey themselves the way they should. But one of the one of the the, the most important of them is, is that it's a it's essentially a joke. That it is silent. The fact that it is silent is a comic device. It isn't just a silent piece. It isn't a silent movie. It's uh, you're supposed to be asking, as presumably people on television, uh, people watching television at that time would far more than than we do now. Why is this silent? Why aren't they talking? Is is it a silent piece, or are they simply not talking? And then and there are actual jokes to to convey that mm. point the uh you know the the, the deaf and dumb institute and, and things you know where you think right now we're reaching a point where if people can talk they will hear but they don't right. and then you find out there's a reason why they haven't still so it is actually quite cleverly done it's not it's not handled perfectly unfortunately but it is a, it it is a comic device, and then and then obviously Groucho coming in and finally talking at the very end, as well as being delightful because here comes Groucho and nobody knew he was going to be there. Um, that again is a joke. He he breaks the illusion. He breaks the uh, the artifice and talks, which had, they all could have done at any point. Okay, let me get into my soon to be debunked theory here, which uh, came to me only this morning uh, while watching this one more time. The two writers. Del Skeltois, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, and James Edmiston don't have many credits. And none of that they do have are even remotely connected to comedy. They wrote westerns, didn't they? They wrote a lot of horse operas. By the way, Edmiston died about a month before the show aired. Mm. My hunch, and I have no real proof of this, is that this was not originally written as a comedy. My guess is that this was a TV drama script that was adapted for the brothers. Now think about it. There are no real jokes or gags on the page. Whatever laughs there are were obviously added by the brothers or the director on the set while filming. Yeah. And I think the scene with Groucho at the end was thrown in when he agreed to do it. Uh, it certainly isn't necessary to the story, which basically ended the scene before. Mm. And like I said, this is only a hunch, but I can't imagine that the script was the result of these two guys being hired to write something for Harpo and Chico Marx. Hmm. Maybe it was conceived as an actual plot for a jewel robbery, <laughs> and they decided this will never work, but we could make a film of it. A kind of meta silent film. It's a little bit, it's silent in a way that the way Mel Brooks' silent movie is, mm. it's silent yeah. in a in a meta theatrical way. And yeah. um, there's something about um, the little reprises of classic bits. You know, we get to see Harpo blow smoke bubbles. Yeah, and, yeah, and there's a gookie in there. Yeah. So Brooks's people do talk, though, don't they? That's the thing. Mel Brooks's Mel Brooks's people do talk, and they have and they have um, speech cards. So 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 that is right, is a right. silent movie, whereas this is a movie that just happens to be silent. Chico does talk at one moment, but he's drawn out by sirens. Yes, he is yeah, talking. It, right. It is very clever. I wonder done. too if the silence of it was oh, both a way to solve the how do you write for Harpo problem, but also a way to solve the Chico mm. can't learn lines mm. easily anymore problem. You know, when you think about it, there's no real reason to think that Harpo can't talk here. Perhaps he just doesn't mm. get around to it like the others in the show. That's right. Yeah, that's that's I think that is the joke. And the casting of him in that role, the casting of them is is in a sense to make to make that joke. But in a better casting would have been Harpo and you know Buster Keaton or Harpo and a, and a, and a silent comedian. So you're not buying my theory that this wasn't originally conceived as a comedy? I thought it was on. I, no, I think there's merit there. 
No, I think there's definite merit there. I mean, it's obviously the the the, the only things that are overtly comic are the the ridiculous uh, methods they use in order to you know the stealing the food and 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 all those things. Um, possibly that that's been been you know comedied up from a from a less silly original idea. But I think it's it's very relevant that, that the only really big laughs in it. I mean, I think there are only two actual kind of laughs proper mm-hmm. laughs are both semi improvised or certainly not not yeah. not something that you exactly. can convey easily in a script one is right. the very amusing interplay between chico and the cop when the cop realizes and then chico realizes what the cop realizes that's very nicely mm-hmm. done but that's that's purely that's all performance and the other is when chico is handcuffing harpo badly and, yeah. ma- and makes harpo yeah. laugh yeah. and then yeah. he helps out <laughs> that's all that's all in performance isn't it Okay, what do you say we get into the show with like a mini deep dive, a shallow dive, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. We start with a long, long, drawn-out scene with Harpo driving up, walking, hiding from a policeman, breaking into a paint store (laughs) to steal some paint and brushes. Uh, Takes about four minutes and serves really no purpose and wastes a lot of time. And it isn't until the last Mm. moment that somebody remembered that this was supposed to be a comedy. Yeah. Harpo throws a cookie. Because when you cut when you cut all the fluff out, when you cut out Ronald Reagan and the and the reprise bit, and when you just chop it down to to the actual meat of the Marx Brothers, yeah. um, you've actually got almost exactly the length of a of a short comedy, haven't you? I think it comes in at about twenty one minutes. So it's it's a two it's basically a two reeler, and it's not the, the the structuring is wrong. It's it's not that there is too much in the first ten minutes that should be done in very snappy shots. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. You know, we see the car pull up, and we see the car stop, and we see him get out, and we see him get in. Um, yeah, and then uh, then he meets up, he meets up with Chico who's in his own car. And Chico looks yeah. half asleep, but you know. But and then Chico, you know, Chico's doing his own thing where he's breaking into an auto parts store and grabbing some stuff. Now I got to ask this: Now, why do they have to commit a separate <laughs> robbery to get a can of paint and some flashlights? You know, <laughs> they can't just go in and buy those things, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a lovely idea that we're thinking, why are they doing this? Why are they why are they taking a sausage? Why are they taking? You know, it, it is nice, um, but obviously we're tipped off by the title that there is a jewel robbery in the offing, and uh, it just needs mm-hmm. it just needs to be tightened up so much. I do love the gookie though. I love that painting. I wish I had it of our founder and Harpo putting the brush on his chin. I think that's a a, a, yeah. a glorious last gookie. You should actually get your mother to do that painting, Bob. <laughs> to, to recreate <laughs> and apparently they don't have uh, a place in mind to rob until after they're all ready to go and they finally open the phone book and chico yes. decides to pick a place to, <laughs> <laughs> to rob but you know there just there just seems to be a lot of wasted opportunities here i mean we got harpo alone in a deli and mm, not one mm. gag he just goes in takes a salami and a bagel and he's out of there you know you would think they come up with something it makes you kind of long for the deli stuff and love happy, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, when we evaluate these later efforts, the whole premise that we apply to our criticism of the films, which is to what extent is this an essential, authentic Marx Brothers experience, just goes out the window. You have to set that aside. Be- because Go West is a more authentic Marx Brothers experience mm. than The Incredible Jewel Robbery. What's frustrating is not that there are gags that aren't working or aren't funny. Like, they're not even trying to do gags. There's just a yeah. lot of effort and movement without, like, any payoff. You know, you, you could debate whether it worked or not or, you know, whether they missed the mark on the joke. But they're not even trying to do jokes. They're just they're just biding time. Actually, another another point in favor of your argument, Bob, is is the music. This is this film has got a score by by no less than Elmer Bernstein. So it's it's mm-hmm. it's it's by no means a chopped liver library soundtrack. But at, at virtually no point does the music let on that this is a comedy, does it? It's it's completely no. straight music all the way through. So after the commercial break, we begin the second portion of the show. It's the day of the robbery. Harpo's outside the jewelry store, his back's to us, and he puts on his mask, and he turns around, and surprise, it's a Groucho, glasses and mustache and the whole schmear. I mean, that's a good joke, isn't it? Because yeah. obviously, oh, yes, it if, is. You're gonna, if you're nice going to do a disguise, him. that's one of the disguises, you know. Oh, absolutely. You yes. know, one... You could even, if you wanted to, uh, to go go wild with your theory, you could say that's that that was written in from the start, and that's where the idea came from. But, you know, <laughs> ah. it's, it's it is you know yeah. an obvious disguise to pick. Right. Know. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, when 
when Harpo impersonates Groucho, and then later when Groucho really appears, something happens on the soundtrack that very much wants to be Hooray for Captain yep. Spaulding, mm. but they couldn't use it. Exactly. Also, the, the um, durability of the Groucho image in all of its many forms. The Groucho glasses that Harpo puts on clearly give him the old grease paint look. You know, it's a big, mm. thick black mustache and eyebrows that look like the 1930s. When Groucho shows up, of course, it's yeah. you bet your life era Groucho, yeah. but he's still recognized as the same face. Yeah, that's another missed opportunity. I, you know, I wish they would have convinced him to put on the grease paint, uh, if only to make that gag work. You know, right. I think he would understand. Yes, that. yes, exactly. Uh, so that's another example of it not quite being handled properly, where you uh, people tend to miss the point of that joke, isn't it? Which is that the, the jeweler you know, recognized it, particularly on the, on the castle films, um, super eight edit. The joke is actually uh, killed, isn't it? It's, it mm -hmm. doesn't, it, it's edited to a point where it's not a joke at all anymore. So back to the robbery, Harpo comes into the store and pulls an actual gun on the jeweler played by uh, comic Benny Rubin, who proceeds to start giving Harpo all sorts of jewelry and uses his foot to set off an alarm. Now we hear the alarm on the soundtrack, but Harpo doesn't seem to flinch. So, Perhaps he's deaf as well. I don't know. Anyhow, Chico pulls up in his police car. I don't know how they knew the real police wouldn't already show up or get there real soon. Um, Chico comes in and arrests Harpo to the jeweler's delight. And we get the one great moment in the show, at least in my opinion, where he, he's having trouble handcuffing Harpo and they get all tangled. And Chico actually hands Harpo the gun for a moment to finish it up. Finally, he takes Harpo away. But for some reason, uh, the jeweler doesn't notice it that they've taken the jewels with them. I don't know if this yes. is a mistake <laughs> in the script or <laughs> what. I don't know. As they're leaving, two real cops pull up uh, and see that Chico has everything under control, although they don't seem suspicious that Harpo is sitting in the front of the police car. <laughs> now, the gag that ends the story could very well come at this moment, but... I guess they have 10 more minutes to fill. So we get a pointless scene where they encounter an in distress pregnant lady outside a home for the deaf. So again, it's, it's a joke, you know, we're, we're supposed to be thinking, you know, why, why are they still not talking? Oh, I see. That's why, but it comes too late and it, and it interrupts the flow of the, of the post, the post robbery sequence. So it just, it feels extraneous, even though it isn't, it's, it's, you know, it's a nice little joke in its own right. But after helping the lady in the hospital, they encounter two more policemen who notice that the logo they've painted on their car is the reverse colors of the real logo, and the jig is up. Um, I think this would have been the end of the show if they hadn't gotten Groucho to agree to uh, participate. But since they did, we get one more scene in the police station in a police lineup where Harpo is not identified by the jeweler uh, because he isn't wearing the big mustache and glasses. Groucho is recognized, even though he isn't either. Yeah, good point. <laughs> but wait, before we get to that, we have a fan another fantastic missed opportunity on the Marxist part. We have two other guys in a police lineup. Now, you got your brothers <laughs> Zeppo and Gummo yeah. in town. Yeah. Now, come on, would it have been that hard yeah. to throw them in an old suit and put them in the lineup and just stand there? Just to stand you know, there, It would have yeah. been so perfect. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, what a shame. And then Groucho lopes in, we get the almost Captain Spaulding theme, and then the duck comes down. Well, Groucho says his famous line, We won't talk until we see our lawyer. And then the duck comes down, and that's it. And for all intents and purposes, the, uh, that was the end of the Marx Brothers' career together on screen. I must say, I'm, I'm intrigued, though. The, now, you've, now you've brought up this idea of it, of it not being originally thought of as a comedy. Um, the, 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 the idea that the ending would have been the, the sign being painted the wrong way, that's all, you know, if you forget the fact that it's Chico, if you forget the fact that they did it with a salami or whatever it was they used to make, you know, just simply the fact that they, they, you know, they stage a jewel robbery, they get away with it, and then they're caught out, something as elementary as that. That's almost like an Alfred Hitchcock Presents twist, isn't it? Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking that the script originally was, something like that, that got rejected. They, they made they made such an elementary mistake, and that's what catches them. That could be Alfred Hitchcock Presents, yeah. actually. So I think, yeah, I think you're onto mm -hmm. something there. And they just it just needed more work. It needed, probably needed more time, which is what you don't have in television, isn't it? It just needed more time. Like I said earlier, what raised the red flag for me were these writers' past credits, which 
included nothing, nothing remotely comic. Um, it's just hard to fathom that they'd be commissioned to write something for these legends. If we're going to be a straight drama, I can understand trying some new blood, but that wasn't the case here. And it's got a completely straight score as well, which obviously would have been written, yeah. you know, ahead of time. Probably would have been written, you know, way ahead of time. So after Groucho cracked the door open with Jewel Robbery, it looked like we were going to get something approaching a full-scale reunion when they soon started work on a TV pilot entitled Deputy Seraph. Uh, the three brothers actually shot footage together, but uh, it was never finished as Chico was deemed too ill to ensure. Those are the basic facts most of us fans know, but I wish we could find somebody who could dig a bit deeper. Uh, Matthew, can you help? Believe it or not, I happen to have the very man right here. In this box, if we just open the lid, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, that, that was the sound of his voice laughing. Andrew T. Smith is his name. He's, uh, he's a writer and a filmmaker, and you may well know him as the author of Marks and Remarks, the, the definitive history of uh, Flywheel, Shyster and Flywheel in all its uh, various manifestations. But he also has a, a particular interest in uh, Deputy Seraph because, as, as many of you will, of course, know, the... Um, the, the, the nature of the program was that it, the Marx Brothers would appear in a wraparound sequence in which they would play angels who are tasked with going down to earth and, and helping people out, whereupon they would uh, take on the physical forms of other people. And so as uh, therefore the, the burden on them as performers was, was obviously considerably less. And uh, the, the other sequences would be shot separately with, with other cast members. So the fact that the scripts exist for these sequences has meant that uh, a kind of perpetual dangling golden carrot uh, exists. Uh, could we could we pull this thing together again? And that's one of one of Andrew's one of Andrew's dream projects. And uh, when we staged the Bath Marks Festival in in 2016, uh, he showed us a kind of a kind of a work in progress, um, which uh, uh, perhaps you could tell us some more about, Andrew. Andrew Tisa. Yeah, sure. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Um, so, yeah, for the, for the Bath Marks Festival, what I did was uh, got hold of a 16 millimeter print of what exists of Deputy Seraph, at least as far as I know, um, and put that together in an order with the missing sequences bridged by narration, just to give a live audience a, a genuine understanding of how it was supposed to play out because i think it does make a difference well let's go let's go back a little and, maybe, and we'll talk about more about that later could you tell us about how this project came to be i mean the marxists have been you know proposed things all through the decade why did why did this particular project hit that, that groucho decided to go along in particular uh well it was uh the writer philip rapp who came up with this idea for the show um primarily because he kept bumping into the marxists at the hillcrest country club by most accounts and um, mm -hmm. they were all people who were in his orbit and i think he was particularly fond of of harpo um and this idea just came to him and through those connections for some reason it all it all started to come together um so the the network um that they were approaching and the finances they were approaching were interested in having all the three brothers or not at all. Right. Um, and Groucho was the last to, the last to jump on board. No. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure why he eventually decided to do it because it does seem, you know, an odd choice of a series, I think. Um, but for some reason, the stars aligned and they jumped straight into production. One thing that I think a lot of people don't, um, realize I certainly didn't realize for a long time is that even in the limited capacity in which the Marxes were involved, just in these little little wraparound sequences, even even in those, Groucho wasn't going to be in them all, was he? No, no. When they when they did finally ink the deal, he was going to be in every third episode. So it mm -hmm. would always it would always have the double act of Chico and Harpo, but Groucho would weirdly, given that the the series is kind of named for the Deputy Seraph. Groucho would appear in every third episode as opposed to every single one. So is this going to be a, a syndicated series or was it going to be on a, a network at least? Uh, I don't know about the details in terms of the networks that were involved, but in terms of the financing, it was going to be this rather odd um, international co-production. So on the American side was going to be um, Sol Lesser Productions providing some of the financing. And then on the British side, 
was uh, JR for Rank Productions. Um, and the idea was going to be that they would shoot the Mark scenes in Hollywood and the the Earthbound scenes would be filmed in uh, Pinewood in England. Mm-hmm. Um, and this seemed to be pretty much set in stone until um, until Philip Rapp uh, put, uh, until Philip Rapp returned from England, which was when it all fell apart when when Chico's um, insurance failed to come through. Um, so I assume that there must have at least been some tentative arrangements with networks, but uh, to be honest, I, I don't know. Um, the script is available, mm-hmm. I guess, in a book. I've never really seen it. Was all the Mark stuff for the pilot shot, was that all completed? The majority of it was filmed. Um, what exists today is not the original Rushes. What exists, at least in the public domain, is um, Philip Rapp's work print. So mm-hmm. it's possible they could have filmed more than is featured in the current extant print. Um, mm. And from memory, I think all but one very small scene is is complete. Uh, there are a couple of deviations from the script, but nothing nothing major. And certainly in terms of making sense of the story, it's all there. I remember um, when you, in your presentation at Bath Marks, you said something along the lines of, uh, so is this, is this a great lost Marx Brothers project? Well... Not really, and it, and it has to be said that it you know that it it obviously isn't, but uh, it does make a big difference seeing it um, in a, in a vaguely assembled form and seeing it in better quality. The 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 clips and pieces that uh, most of us have seen on on documentaries and on YouTube are very very bad um, multi generational copies. But you had a, yeah. a pretty clean uh, a pretty clean print, didn't you? Yeah, I, I kind of um, when I heard the that Bath Marx was coming up, I decided well, this would be a, a, an excellent way to showcase this. So I extended the feelers out into the collector's markets just to see who had 16 millimeter copies. And um, a chap called Eric Grayson, whose work I highly recommend you check out, um, did have... Never heard of the guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he did have a 16 millimeter print. Hi, Eric. Uh, he did have a 16 millimeter print that we he kindly arranged to um, to have scanned. Um, unfortunately, his print is missing a couple of seconds of material, so we mm. do need to get hold of somehow another 16 millimeter print to to plug the gap. Yeah, those, those clips that are online don't really do it justice, you know. It's, no, not at Chico, all. Chico standing there trying to remember his lines, and people just waiting around it. You know, nothing's going to look good in that. You know, when you see it pieced together, and I haven't seen Andrews, but I I actually just came across something on YouTube where another fan has taken uh, various quality uh, clips and put something together and it, it actually pieces together somewhat well and you could get a good much better sense of what it was supposed mm. to be and mm. it's it's while not a classic it certainly seemed at least worth worth the effort yeah that I th- they were given it i think with with what exists of serif the the interesting stuff is in the very small details it's there's there are no great revelations to be had from watching the footage but there are mm. little things like how quickly you can see groucho's interest just drop as soon as the take is over. <laughs> you know, he, he'll turn it on for the camera, but as soon as someone you know yells cut or something, it just his his eyes glaze over. It's it's little things like that you can't see in a VHS tape. And I guess it's possible this still could be finished since the Marxist stuff is basically done. The Earthbound footage could be produced. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that would be the dream. Yeah, to, to either finish it on film or perhaps even as a as a live performance. I think the what. The Earthbound scenes would work well as stage farce and then project the Marx Brothers material above yeah. that. Mm. Yeah. But a I, either That's option would take a lot, a yeah. lot of organization. <laughs> you know, the script, which is available in a book called The Television Scripts of Philip Rapp, uh, Rap, which is a Bear Manor book from 2007, it is interesting. I mean, it's true that this is not a lost masterpiece, but on the other hand, it is kind of a, a respectable effort to use the Marx Brothers in a TV show mm. um, that's not just trying to put them through their old paces. Right. It, it's an interesting concept, casting them as these kind of inhabiting spirits, which allows other actors to sh- sort of share the Marx Brothers roles in the story. Um It's kind of interesting that Harpo and Chico are working under their own names, which um was an early trend which comes back later in their career Mm -hmm. and although the footage that exists of them is um i think simon luvish used the word melancholy it's a good word for for the way it feels um there are a lot of little interesting 
things. Harpo and Chico play this harp and piano duet Mm -hmm. that weaves um, when the saints go marching in along with I'm Daffy over you and (laughs) a little bit of angels we have heard on high. Even the whole idea of the Marx Brothers as angels is kind of compelling. It, it's um, it reminds us of Joe Adamson's evocation of the D. H. Lawrence line about three strange angels, and Harpo and Chico in particular because they they seem so. I don't know. They do have this sort of ethereal quality in that footage. Mm. Mm. There's something moving about them at this point in their career. Um, standing on a cloud playing their instruments. Mm. Yes, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I think all it takes really is just the, the willingness to accept that they are they are old men. You know, I mean, it, you, you're mm. obviously not going to get the Marx Brothers from from monkey business. So so if you go into it wanting that, then obviously it will be a huge disappointment. But if you take it for what it is and you have a realistic expectation, there is certainly potential there. I mean, I I like I like seeing old people being funny it's not something that that turns me off yeah. at all and i think andrew i you you it would be fair to say that you have a a weakness for swan song projects don't you you're a big love <laughs> yeah. happy fan for instance in fact one of my favorite um bits of your book uh if i can just find it yes is a there's a footnote in your book where you you mention love happy at, at one point and then in a footnote you write i realize that favorably comparing love happy to any film is a crime worthy of capital punishment in some marxian circles but this is my book and i can write what i like no no <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember writing that at all <laughs> but you yeah you are somebody with a weak with a weakness for uh for the the, the final projects aren't you of, of uh stars yeah I, I, yeah i think so and i i think maybe it's just the contrarian in me that likes to defend these kinds of things because i i did my my master's degree my dissertation for my master's degree was on screen stars swan songs so i wrote about um at all k for example with laurel and hardy <laughs> in not peak physical condition and that's another one of those projects where a lot of fans you'll find online just will say, oh, I've never watched that. I couldn't bring myself to watch that. Oh, it would just make me sad or something because, you know, you're seeing these these beloved stars mm. as they see it on the on the brink of death. But then you have to think, well, no, they, they weren't really. They were, they were given a creative freedom that they hadn't had for a long time. And Stan Laurel did get better. So if you have that kind of broader contextual knowledge, there's no there's no guilt to be had in enjoying these things. Mm-hmm. And like so many, like so many of them, you just wish, like, oh, gee, it's not such a bad idea. Maybe if they'd done this like five years earlier, mm-hmm. it yeah. could have been something. And yet, sometimes it seems like if it had been earlier, it would have seemed like a more egregious departure from what we expect of them. Mm. You know, like the premise of Deputy Seraph, which I'm trying to argue is a sort of novel and clever one. You know, it could also be said that what that premise does is it locks the Marx Brothers eternally into a state where their only function is to help of those kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true, that, yes. that is what they do in, in this script. Perhaps what it needed was uh, Sig Ruman is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> the curtain will go up again next season. <laughs> hey, that's a pretty good Hendrik Van Loon. <laughs> well, I, I suppose if, if you're trying to if you're trying to justify that, you could say that. In, in the context of Seraph, this is their job. So who knows what will happen to them if they don't help with those kids? You know, where will, <laughs> where will they be sent? So so for people who, who haven't read the scripts and uh, and don't know 
anything other, about the the meat of the programs. What basically they get into other people's bodies and and then kind of farce ensues, uh, comic scrapes. Yeah, and... yeah. In the um in the in the pilot script, they they're getting involved with a um a plot to make sure that a young couple do end up together, despite the objections of the young woman's guardian and uncle, who is a rather highly strung um, maestro. Um, and so, yeah, they, to do that, they inhabit the bodies of various people in and around a hotel in in France, I believe it is, or is it Monte Carlo? It's almost as if I'm not an expert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the Riviera, isn't it? Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> um, and the occasional well-timed phone call from Groucho as well, disguising his voice. Um, but I think the it's it's that that makes the the series such a tantalising possibility. It's the idea that every week a different set of actors would have to essentially become the Marx Brothers because they're mm-hmm. having they're, they're being mm. their characters are being inhabited, and and so and particularly because this was going to be filmed in England. Um, just imagining the kind of actors who were around at that time working in filmed television, mm-hmm. um, you know, people like um, Leslie Phillips, Sid James, mm. Patrick McNee, Anna Blackman, Patrick Troughton, um, lots of actors who really did have a deep respect for the Marx Brothers and would have given it their all just to appear alongside them, even though they were filming their parts in separate countries. Um, I think it... it at best, it could have been very entertaining. At worst, it could have been like watching Peter Sellers' rubbish impression of Groucho for half an hour each week. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other scripts or stories done outside besides the pilot? Or was as as, as as far as I know, no. And I've been in touch with the Rab Estate, um, and they don't think so either. Um, they were they were planning to do thirty nine. Wow, um, <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's quite that's quite a tall order. <laughs> um, but I think, other than the vaguest of vague ideas in terms of what kinds of stories they could do, I don't think there were any concrete plans when it got the plug pulled. Getting Chico to do thirty nine of anything at that point, uh, <laughs> let, al- let, let alone. Uh... <laughs> I think I think we would have seen some uh, footage uh, recycled. Yes. Yeah. 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 Instead, alas, as we know, he, he couldn't be insured even to play a dead guy. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the footage you cut together for Bath Marks. Any chance you're going to put it out there for us all to see? Uh, I, I would love to make it available wider. It's just a matter of doing it right, I suppose. I, the, the Bath Marks version was prepared at quite high speed, um, mm-hmm. even, even though I think it, it worked very well in that context. Um but ultimately, I'd, I'd love to find some way of, of completing the pilot, whether that is, you know, mm. filming it with new actors, whether that is putting on some sort of live performance or maybe doing a sort of semi-animated storyboard of the sequences that weren't done. Cinco's ears just perked up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> well it, it, yeah, if he's up for that, yeah. <laughs> um. But if people want to see it, um, yeah, make, make your voices known. Um, we do need to find a second print in order to get those missing seconds. Mm-hmm. Um, annoyingly, those missing seconds come from the one sequence in which all three brothers appear together on screen. It only happens mm-hmm. at one point during the <laughs> during the whole uh, film sequences. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, as I said, I've been in touch with uh, Philip Rapp's estate, and they've got more. Of some, dis- you know, they've got paperwork, they've got photographs, but in order to to go through all of that, it'll take some degree of commitment and organisation to an end goal. So it really is is the demand there, and if so, we'll we'll have a try at figuring something out. Awesome! Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Uh, perhaps you'll come back sometime when there's more to report on this. I would love to, and keep thinking about that uh, live live version of it because. Uh... Here's to oh, Bath yeah. Marks yeah. too. That's all I can say. <laughs> that that is a damn fine point. Yes. <laughs> well, take care. Thanks again, Andrew. All right. No. Cheers, problem. Andrew. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, with the abrupt end of Deputy Seraf, that appeared to be it for the Marxes. However, one last tantalizing project was dangled, and this was the most ambitious of all. In 1960, famed director Billy Wilder proposed a big modern day Marx outing entitled "A Day at the United Nations." Uh, surprisingly, Groucho loved the idea, and an outline was commissioned and written before health issues 
aborted the project. Yeah, apparently it was it was taken very seriously. It was it was a Billy Wilder and IAL Diamond um, idea. It was pitched to the Mirish uh, Mirish brothers, who were all for it. Uh, all three Marx brothers were tentatively um, uh, going going to be behind it. Um, the story, um, and I quote, Groucho Marx is the brains behind a heist mob. Their scheme is that since the New York police are so occupied with protecting the United Nations delegates, the rest of Manhattan is unguarded. They plan to pull a Tiffany caper. Chico would play the strong arm guy of the mob. Harpo would be the safe cracker. One scene would show Harpo unable to open a can of sardines. Using sewers as a passage, they blast their way into Tiffany's and steal four suitcases of diamonds. They plan a getaway on a tramp steamer going to Brazil. At the docks, there is an anti-communist picket line. The police think the Marx Brothers are the Latvian delegation and take them by police escort to the Latvian embassy uptown. At the climax, Harpo addresses the UN in pantomime, tooting the horn, lunging at adjacent blonde delegates, while four simultaneous and different translations interpret him. And Maurice Zolitau in the book Billy Wilder in Hollywood goes on to say that Wilder informed Groucho of the story. Groucho loved it, uh, told, told Wilder to phone Gummo, who was their agent, to make a deal. Uh, Gummo said if Groucho loved it, then Harpo would do it for Groucho. And Zeppel wouldn't do it for anybody. <laughs> Wilder said, how about Chico? And Gummo said, no sweat. Chico will do it. He always needs the money. So IAL Diamond and Billy Wilder elaborated a 40-page treatment. The Mirish brothers were ecstatic over the prospect of the Marx brothers. Uh, then Harpo collapsed during a rehearsal of a television special. He recovered, but the adverse publicity made the Marx Brothers uninsurable. Um, no studio starts a film if the stars can't pass a physical. Could the Tiffany Caper film be a vehicle for another set of comedians? Wilder decided it would not work with any other comedians, so he abandoned it. When you, when you picture what they what they looked like then... It does. It really mm. does feel like a like a pipe dream. I can't imagine yeah. them pulling that one off. To be honest, maybe if it was 1955. Yeah, they got away with it. But by this point, no. You can see what they've got in mind if you look at that Wilder film yeah. One Two Three with with Jimmy Cagney. Mm. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of what's in that's what's in Wilder's mind. But I I don't think the Marx Brothers could have could have reproduced that at this stage. It certainly would have been interesting to see what kind of alchemy would have occurred with them working with Billy Wilder. Although, as you've argued very convincingly, Matthew, they were not necessarily best teamed with a, a comic visionary director. Mm. And I, I, one thing that I find intriguing about this, this project, though, this might have been, is the very setting using the United Nations. It's so aggressively modern for that period. It, you know, it's clearly placing the Marx Brothers in a post-World War II world. Whereas, um, as you've also pointed out, Matthew, from the late MGM films forward, and very much including things like The Incredible Jewel Robbery, the Marxes are clearly being packaged as a nostalgia act. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but putting them in a piece that is you know, located around the UN and uses the United Nations in the title. It's a kind of aggressively modern setting for them. And that's intriguing. Yes, it's almost like an anticipation, isn't it, of of the of the what happened to to Groucho uh, literally and the Marx Brothers by by extension at the at the end of the sixties. Um, it's it's the first real sign of them uh, being thought of in 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 the present tense. Yeah. So th does this forty-page treatment uh, exist anywhere that we could see? Um, I don't know. I mean, I got that from a from um, one of the Billy Wilder biographies. Uh, so the guy who wrote that biography had obviously seen it. That's as that's as, as close as I've got to it. There, there's a subject for further investigation. But obviously, something was was shown to to the to the, the Mirish brothers for them to okay it as a as a project. So it, to to some extent, there must at least be a detailed. Uh, synopsis uh, you know treatment so that was the end of the marxes as an active team in 1961 plans were announced for an animatronic animated series to feature the marx characters with others doing the voices which the three did approve uh Seppo apparently didn't want to compete with another wooden version of himself 
Um, but, <laughs> but nothing became of this plan, and our story ends with Chico's death that October. So there. How you doing, guys? <laughs> so no, I'm just <laughs> yeah. That was very sad. I was just thinking about Chico dying. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about after Chico dying is that you know Harpo lived three more years, and we've never seen a picture of Groucho and Harpo together after Chico's death. Mm. They, they, you know, there were lots of pictures of the brothers together before then, but they really went their separate ways. We have a picture with Groucho with Zeppo, I believe at some film festival in the late sixties. And then, then there's that stuff from the, from the seventies at Groucho's 85th birthday party with Gummo and Zeppo, but we really don't have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think he did, Harpo did retreat into, into a, a very, a very uh, comfortable and complete retirement, I think at that point, didn't he? And they did live, uh, you, you know, not near to each other. Apparently they telephoned all the time, but mm-hmm. uh Yes, no, there aren't, as far as I know, there aren't any photo, even, uh, you know, even family snaps that have come to light. I mean, obviously, Bill Marx's yeah. archive of home movies and photographs has been has been more or less opened up to us all. But yes, no, there doesn't seem to be anything of Groucho dropping in on, on Harpo. Or, or Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, guys, time for a final exam. Uh, of all the things we've talked about, either real or rumored, which one do you wish had been completed? Um, I'm not sure any of it really. I mean, the thing that they did do that I that I most wish we had, obviously, is that is that tonight interview. In terms of the things that they that they didn't do, um, I guess the biopic it would have to be that biopic, wouldn't it? Although I'm sure it wouldn't have been much cop. Um, but again, for the mm. same reason, really, just just for a chance to see them all again and to see Gummo and to see the older Zeppo and. Uh, not not for any intrinsic merit that the thing itself would would be likely to have possessed, and for that reason, certainly not the the Wilder project. I think that would have been Deputy mm-hmm. Seraph and then some. The Animal Crackers uh, remake would have given us a chance to see what none of this other material gives us, which is at this point in their careers, how would the Marx Brothers fare with excellent material mm-hmm. and a live audience? Yeah. I feel, although I agree with uh, the general skepticism regarding the Billy Wilder project, uh, I, I would be intrigued to see what that would have been. It's partly a sense that, although it wouldn't have been a Marx Brothers movie in the way we want it to be, um, I don't you feel like Billy Wilder wouldn't have allowed them to look too bad in it and would have maybe found interesting ways. Or, or he was a, an artist who might have been capable of finding interesting ways to make the Marx Brothers work as a comedy team as they were then. Yes, I guess. I mean, it's just it depends on how much how far they're willing to to sort of go. I mean, if he, I think if, if you start with. Uh, you know, Harpo has to be silent. Chico has to have an Italian accent. Then, then even Billy Wilder, you know, is going into it to a certain extent with his with his hands tied behind his back. Um, if he yeah. was given absolute free reign, um, if they were in that in that pre room service frame of mind where they were willing to say, okay, you know, at this point, particularly at this stage of the game, where there's nothing really riding on it, let's let's do whatever he asks of us let's go into this with a completely clean slate then yes that that would be interesting i don't know if that was i presume not uh the idea well like many of the marx projects over the years it mattered less whether it was a good idea than who was doing it I, what thalberg wanted to do with the team in a night at the opera wasn't a good idea but once he got kaufman and riskin on board it was going to be a success uh who knows what wilder would have done and even if it was great on paper could the marxes have pulled it off at their advanced stage i don't know he certainly couldn't have done a typical Marx Brothers idea, but then you know I, that wasn't that no. wasn't the intention. So I think the big question mark is is how how up for reinvention they were, and and obviously how 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 energetic they were. And the evidence suggests that the answer to both of those questions is not mm, very. Yeah. And and Harpo, uh, his character choices were becoming liabilities. Although it's always delightful to see him, no matter what, I'd be fascinated to watch an hour-long film of an elderly Harpo sleeping in an armchair. <laughs> you know, we would we would study that with great interest. If, if only Andy Warhol had proposed I mean, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with the soundtrack of Go West, <laughs> it was on TV and he fell asleep. Yeah, per who could blame him? But you know, I mean, Harpo. Um, 
especially without particularly inspired material, um, you know, having to do all of the sort of cute mugging mm. um, with those deep lines in his face, it, it just, it acquires a melancholy that you don't get as much from the elderly Groucho. Mm. And even Chico, I mean, to the extent that he was ever allowed to show he still had it, you know, he could be an elderly Italian wise guy. Mm. Um, but Harpo, I mean, if they had done the Animal Crackers remake, would it would have been? Would, would we have had to watch this elderly Harpo chasing chorus mm. girls around? What would that have looked like? I mean, a very interesting point that Glenn Mitchell made, which hadn't hadn't struck me before, which is that you know we kind of um, belabor MGM for for making the explicit Harpo can't talk rather than doesn't talk thing um but but as glenn pointed out to me that in in his harpo's later appearances on television uh on on variety shows and and in other other tv shows he he really labors that point himself harpo never misses a chance to to make it overt that he can't speak that seems to be at that point yeah. that seems to be very much who harpo is in his mind is a, is a comic character who can't speak um, so I presume that would have been. I think uh, that was how to make it work yes, in a talk show yeah. appearance. But obviously, you know, I mean, the, there's a re, there's a radio, uh, very funny radio sketch, isn't there, that he's involved with, where he, he the joke is that he doesn't. And similarly, uh, Gary Cooper is there and just saying "yep" all the time. So, so yeah. you know that that <laughs> it works right. there. Um, but but yeah, from then on, he does he does completely capitulate to the, to the MGM concept. Because what I don't know what else he could have done as a guest on on the Today Show, you know. He, um, it, it's not like someone was crafting a, a a segment for him where he steals somebody's birthmark or, mm-hmm. or or all the silverware. But I do think you know that you you have to take your hat off to to, to jewel robbery to that extent. It doesn't come across very well, but I think that is the intention that it is supposed to be a joke that they don't rather than that they can't. In those early scenes in Jewel Robbery, where Harpo's just on the street smoking a cigarette, wearing a trench coat and a fedora, it's very noirish. Mm. And it does suggest for an instant that there's some gravitas to Harpo, some unexplored gravitas that might have been interesting if he had been willing to or given the opportunity to Yes, play I mean as Bob points out, roles. they are professional criminals, aren't they? They're not they're not uh hobos. Uh this is a this yeah. is a you know, a cleverly planned heist by people who own cars and uh, you know. So it, yeah, it is almost a foretaste of what, what Wilder had in mind. Yeah, if they'd shown as much skill stealing the jewels as when they stole the paint and flashlights, maybe they would have gotten away with it. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, go in at night. <laughs> Why? Yes. Right, they, yeah. If they can break in, yeah. And Zeppel didn't appear to be interested in any of these. Yes, even in the even in the biopics where uh, where where Gummo is is listed as definitely on board, it always says maybe Zeppo will be joining them. He he was just had no interest. It's very interesting. He doesn't walk on at Carnegie Hall. He doesn't do a chat show. You know, in, he doesn't go on Cabot. He's genuinely. Uh, and he's impatient with the interviews that there are of him, uh, you know, the Barry Norman one, you know, he's, he's impatient, isn't he? He's constantly saying, and, uh, uh and Oberly. Must be, must I, be, must have been too busy with court appearances. I don't want to be saying this. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like he resents the, the renewal of interest in the act that the, the, the Grand Show revival. Yeah. It's almost like that pisses him off a bit, actually. Mm-hmm. It's like he sees it as also a revival of all the jokes about his uselessness. Yes, yeah, and and he's very very scathing of Groucho, saying, you know, I don't know why he's doing it. You know, he's ruining people's memories. He's not up to it. He, I think he 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 thought it was a, a, yeah. a tasteless and unnecessary development. Mm. Uh, Zeppo kind of inadvertently succeeded by the 1970s in becoming the most enigmatic mm, Marx yeah. brother, the the one you couldn't get. You know, you, you could you could under the right circumstances get Groucho to appear on your show, but Zeppo, mm. you know, out of the question. Financially very comfortable, you know, so no need like Chico to uh, to to be to be yeah. doing anything for the money. Very comfortable, happy, you know, successful lifestyle. Uh, and I, I think he thought it was was a bit seedy, really, to be to be digging it all up again. And yet he kept calling himself Zeppo Marx. That's the oddity, for isn't the rest it? Is it was, yeah, I, yeah, the Zeppo Marx, isn't agency. it? Yeah, yeah. Because he, I mean, I suppose that the name had some currency because he was famous. Although as you know, in Gummo, likewise, and that really didn't have currency, did it? It just seemed like they genuinely, yeah, you know, they would phone each other using those names, and it just seemed like they took on those names. It's very odd. 
mm-hmm. particularly in his case because he you know he it wasn't even a very very long time was it you know i mean when did he join the act uh noah you'd know that 1918 1918 so you're only 17 maybe. yeah 1917 to 1933 is is, is so that what is that uh, 15 years 16, 16 15, years yeah. something like that and then for the rest of his life, this <laughs> yeah. successful man who, you know, has, has made big bucks. He's been an, an agent, a powerful and successful agent. He's He's been an inventor. He's been involved in the war effort. And he's calling himself Zeppo. <laughs> yeah, which does kind of undermine the possibility that he was keeping his distance because he didn't like being mm. a, a walking joke. He's a mystery man. That's That's it, isn't it? He's an unknown quantity. That's what it is. So that's going to do it for this episode. We'll be back next month for a deep dive into everyone's favorite, room service. So get yourself a pint of brandy, handcuff yourselves to a chair, and enjoy the film before we discuss it. Because uh, that's what it's going to take for me. <laughs> so, fellas, any final words? No, that was good. I enjoyed that. No, thank you again to to uh, Andrew T. Smith. Um, yes, thank you, Andrew. And, uh, yes. and do think of that... Uh, of that um, Deputy Sarah project is very much a work in progress. Watch this space. Ah, and Noah, why don't you introduce our final song? Well, the final song uh, could only be one thing. I don't think it even needs to be introduced because you all it's know pretty what it is. It's pretty obvious. It's this. <laughs> Since we already discussed uh, Deputy Seraph, our next episode will be Sans Seraph. <laughs> <laughs> now, come on. Would it have been that hard to throw them in an old suit and put them in the lineup and just stand there? <laughs>